Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Again, everybody, praise the Lord one more time. Amen. It's just a good thing to be here again with us to share, you know, in Bible study. And you know, we have been on the topic of doctrine. Amen. And there is much to say. And, you know, if we should say everything, mighty God, it, we wouldn't stop. But, you know, under the leading of the Holy Ghost, you know, we want to just do as the Lord bids us. Amen. Let me take time out to welcome each and every one. You're streaming from Jamaica, from the USA, Canada, wherever you're streaming from. We, you know, give God thanks that you are able to join in. And, you know, we pray that, you know, your soul will be blessed. We pray that if you are seeking direction, you know, that God will direct your heart, you know, for you to come to know him. You know, especially in a time like this when the time, the signs of the time are saying that his coming is nigh, even at the door. You know, we believe that there are folks, many folks that, you know, is going to come into the house of God and be called the child of God. And, you know, we pray that as many that tune in, you know, that you'll be strengthened and that you will come to the point where you come to know the Lord as Savior. Before we begin, again, I want to pray, opening prayer before we begin. Just bow your heads. As a matter of fact, I'm going to ask us all to, you know, just breathe a word. Father, again, we come before you and we want to thank you, God, for your blessings and thank you for your love and your mercies, God. We thank you for this privilege, oh God, that you afforded us to be alive, to be sitting, to be tuning in, to hear what you have to say about doctrine. We come before you. We ask, God, that you be in our midst. We ask, God, that you touch every heart, every mind, every spirit that tune in. And those who will tune in sometime in the future, we pray, God, that this word tonight this lesson god and doctrine will go forth with anointing and that lord jesus it will accomplish in the lives of people what you will that souls will be strengthened souls will be determined to contend for the faith lord those who do not know you will recognize god and and come to understand that there is a plan for salvation and that outside of this this plan salvation will not be given. We pray that your will be done tonight and we ask God that you have your way as we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Bless the Lord again and welcome, like I said earlier on, and thanks for everyone that tune in. So we have been talking about doctrine and I believe that now we are seeing the importance of doctrine. We are seeing you know, some of the things that are present in the world and some of the things that, you know, I was talking to a friend, you know, and he said, look here, doctrine is really, you know, a war of words. It's spiritual warfare. And, you know, spiritual warfare happens, you know, when the word is spoken, you know, and he mentioned that, you know, Satan took Jesus and Jesus used the word. And it's important for us then to know as children of God, that the word that we have been talking about, this word, the Bible, amen, is where we find life, it's, it's what we use to get direction. And as people of God, you know, we should do our best to live in the word. Amen. So our scripture, you know, is taken from scriptures. First one is taken from 1 Timothy 4, verses 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrine of devils. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meat, which God had created to be received with thanksgiving, of them which believe and know the truth. Then let's go to 2 Timothy 4. And we'll be reading again from 1 through to 4. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead 
at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own loss shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. For they, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Amen. So last week, well, last week we look, we spent some time and we look at baptism in Jesus' name. You know, and I give God thanks. You know, somebody indicated, you know, on the stream that they wanted to be baptized. I'm not sure if that happened. But, you know, we pray that God will continue to convict souls. And even for that individual, that God will continue to convict him that, you know, he will truly, you know, come to know the Lord and surrender to him. Amen. So we did say that the apostles' doctrine was or is the teachings of the apostles. Amen. And just as they received it from Jesus Christ, you know, they gave it to us. And just as we receive it, you know, that is what we intend to do as people who knows the truth. Uh, just as we receive it from the apostles, we want to pass it on. And as we have been saying, as we talk about the doctrine, what we have been doing is going from the Old Testament to the New Testament. So if we talk about repentance, we talk about repentance from the Old Testament and we come and show you in the New Testament that look here, repentance is what God requires of men. If we talk about baptism, which we did last week, we talk about it from the Old and from the New Testament. Amen. And tonight, as we get into the Holy Spirit, we are going to look at what the Old Testament says and what took place in the New Testament. But just to recap for those who are just joining, and for those who miss what we had to say last week, you know, we said that we focus particularly on the mode and the formula and the formula for water baptism. We said First Peter three verses twenty one, which sometimes were of disobedient when once long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing wherein few that is eight souls were saved by water the like figure we are unto baptism even now save us not the putting away of the filth of the flesh but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So Paul, the, the, the apostle Peter, what he did know was that he mentioned um, that baptism was a like figure. And eight were saved and we mentioned about the water and that the water was present. No water caused destruction. Water saved. The water is also a cleansing agent and it was used to deliver folks. So while it took life, it also saved life. Amen. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 and 2. Moreover, brethren, I would not that he should be ignorant that oh, all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses. So even that the, with the Jews consider the crossing of the Red Sea, the apostles said that it was a baptism unto Moses. We said that in the New Testament, the forerunner of Jesus Christ preached baptism, John the Baptist. Mark 1 verses 8, he said that I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Luke 3, 16, John answered them, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come. The straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Amen. The apostles also, they preach Jesus. We said a baptism was accredited to Jesus even though he did not baptize any because the, the disciples, they carry out the baptism, but they did it under the authority 
of Jesus Christ. So the baptism there that took place was accredited to Jesus Christ. Then we also mentioned that the apostles themselves baptized people. And we mentioned Acts 2 verse 38 and we look at those who were baptized on that day. And then we also went through the book of Acts and we look at the different um, sections where persons were baptized. We focused last week also on why is baptism important to, to me as an individual. Amen. And we look at St. John 3, 1 to 7, and we said that Nicodemus came to Jesus and he asked, what shall a man do in order to inherit the kingdom of God? And Jesus said, surely, surely I say unto thee, except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so Jesus made it clear that without baptism, amen, you cannot get into the kingdom. Then we also spoke about Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Again, baptism, we said from this scripture, is like, mm, and it is a part of the plan of salvation, and it shows that it is a necessary part of the plan of salvation. It therefore means that without baptism, amen, a person cannot be saved. So those who are saying that, look here, all you need to do is to pray the prayer and believe and you are saved. That is not scriptural. We say it already and we're going to say it again. We're talking about doctrine and we're talking about that as individuals, we must stand up for this truth, this apostle's doctrine that has been passed down unto us. Amen. And we must stand against all other so-called doctrine, false doctrine, that would want to erode um, that which we receive from our forefathers. Amen. And that is what the, 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 the doctrine from the devil, the doctrines from the devil is trying to do. They are trying to get us to, to move from off where we stand and to embrace the things that they are teaching. But the Bible did not mention anywhere at all that, look here, all a man need to do is to Believe and he's saved. No, because even when James talked about faith and works, he said that, look here, you must show me your works and I'll tell you of your faith. So if your faith is in God and that God is able to save, then the works must follow. And the work that we are talking about now is not a physical work. Amen. Because some folks believe that if they work in the physical, if they do some form of philanthropy and some other things, they can be saved. But the Bible did not teach us about that kind of work. The, what the Bible said the work that we must do now is to believe and then to repent of our sins. That is the work. It has to do also with faith. Baptize in the name of Jesus Christ and receive the infilling of the Holy Ghost and live in holy. That is the plan of salvation. Amen. So we say water baptism then is a part of the plan of salvation. Amen. It is also an act of obedience when Jesus commanded the disciples. He said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The disciples were obedient to Jesus and they carry out the command. I want us to understand that being a part of the church and being a disciple of Christ, the commandment is also for us. Amen. To go e and to make disciples. But we must also receive the commandment in that we must take on the name of Jesus Christ in water baptism. So it is an act of obedience. We said also that baptism is important because it is for the remission of sins. Acts 2 verse 38, then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. We did say that remission means to remove, to cancel, to blot out, to wipe away. Amen. So when we take on baptism, baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, it is really for the remission of sin. It is not to show anybody that look here, I 
now accept Jesus Christ. So hence I want you to see that um, by way of uh, me being baptized. No. What the Bible is telling us that look here, baptism is for the remission, for the removal, for the cancellation of sin. When Jesus said in Luke 24 verses 47, and that repentance and remission of sin must be preached in my name beginning at Jerusalem. He was referring there to baptism. We also said that baptism is important because it identifies us with the burial of Christ. We did say that repentance is likened unto the death. But baptism is likened unto the burial. And if we are going to fulfill this plan of salvation, we have got to be fully identified with the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so when we... Repent of our sin is likened unto his death. When we take on the name of Jesus Christ in water baptism, when we go down, amen, in water, we identify with his burial. Colossians 2 verse 12, we said, Buried with him in baptism, wherein also he are risen with him through faith in the operation of God who had raised him from the dead. When we look at the mode of baptism last week, we said that the mode of baptism is how water baptism is carried out, similar, similarly to how a dead person is buried. Amen. So it is that a person who is going to be baptized must be fully immersed. Amen. In water. So when people talk about sprinkling, amen, and that is another doctrine, and people talk about pouring water, which is another doctrine, the Bible does not teach that. We mentioned last week that John baptized at a place called Anon. Why? The Bible gave the answer and said, because there was much water there. It tells us then that when we consider the mode of water baptism, we must recognize that the person must be fully immersed. When we say that the word for baptism is baptizio, which me means to dip, to plunge, or immerse. So for somebody to sprinkle is an oxymoron. You can't sprinkle and talk about baptism. When we talk about baptism, the person must be fully immersed. Amen, somebody. And then when we look at the formula for water baptism, we say that the formula is what is said over the person before they are immersed in water. Amen. And we look at the scriptural record. G, the, the apostle on the day of Pentecost, Peter, Peter, when Peter got up and spoke on the day of Pentecost, Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. The Bible says, they that heard gladly received the word. In other words, they that Peter preached to receive what Peter said about being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And the Bible went down and said, 3,000 was added unto the church that same day. It means that those 3,000 3, were repented, they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and they received the Holy Spirit. Spirit. That's what Peter understood. That's what the apostles understood. And on the day of Pentecost, when Peter got up to preach, he got the support of the other apostles. If, they, if he did not receive their support, surely some of one, one of them are probably some of them would interject and say, Look here, it's not so it go. But they all supported Peter. And right through scriptures, you see where when the apostles baptized folks, 
they baptized them in the name of Jesus Christ. The Samaritans were baptized, Acts 8 and 16, and they took on the name of Jesus. Um, the Gentiles, Acts 10 and 48, they took on the name of Jesus Christ. John the Baptist, disciples, when we read last week, Acts 19, 1 to 5, and it came to pass, I'm going to read it. Well, Apollos was at Corinth. Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believe? And they said unto him, We have not so much heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And let me just stop here. Because if you're talking about this doctrine, and you're talking about the doctrine that the apostle preached, if you hear about baptism, you must hear about the infilling of the Holy Ghost. If you can't hear about one, and don't hear about the other. So, and it came to pass. Verse 3, And he said unto them, Unto what then were he baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then Paul, John, then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So the Apostle Paul baptized these disciples of John in the name of Jesus Christ. And you know that if baptism was just anything, it was not so much important, then the, the Apostle Paul would say, look here, all right, since you're baptized already, um, you're, you're, you're immersed in water already, there is no need for us to evoke the name over you. So here what you do now, just receive the Holy Ghost. But the Apostle Paul knew that it was important. And he said, look here, John verily baptized unto repentance, saying, believe on him which should come. But he that should have come came already. And now we preach baptism in Jesus' name. And the Apostle baptized them. So we also look at the verse in Matthew 28, verse 19. And we mention a couple of scripture because Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. Amen. So the passage supports baptism. But it does not support baptism in a title. And if we understand last week, I told us that the Bible is grammatically correct. Amen. So when the Bible said, look here, baptize in the name of those of us who know English. When we say name, it's talking about singular. And so when you read the passage, you get the understanding that baptize them in the name of comma, the Father, and of the Son, comma, and of the Holy Spirit. It is saying to us that whosoever is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Bears the same name. So we mentioned Zechariah 4 verse 9. And we said. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord. And his name one. Amen. So we know the name of Jesus Christ. Throughout the scriptures. The Bible in St. Matthew 1 verses 21 tells us. And she shall bring forth a son. And thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Amen. So if you want to know the name of the Son, the name of the Son is Jesus. Then, Jesus in St. John 5 verse 43. 
told us the name of the Father. He said, I come in my Father's name. So if he said to the disciples that, look here, I come in my Father's name, it simply means that his Father and him bear the same name. And then we also look at John 14 and 26. And we talk about the name of the Holy Spirit. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in what? My name. I will know Jesus' name already. And if the Comforter, Jesus come in his Father's name, and the Comforter now, his Father will send in his name. So it means then that all of the titles, the one person that holds the three titles, bears the same name, have the same name. That is why Zachariah tells us that in that day his name shall be one. So Jesus is the only saving name. And we mention Acts 4 verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's also a scripture, I think it's found in Ephesians 3 verses 15. It says that G, the whole family in heaven and earth, yes, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Hold on. That you would grant you according to the riches. All right, so the real is verse 15. So the, the, the family of heaven and earth, the name for that family is Jesus. Amen. So we mention a little bit about the historical records. And, you know, we talk about what the encyclopedia said and what the, the dictionary said and how they all have the, 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 the baptism to be done in the early church, in the name of Jesus Christ. It was after a period of time then, you know, people started to consider baptism in the title, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I want us to understand that as we talk about doctrine, amen, somebody, we have got to recognize what the adversary is doing, amen. Some people will not place an emphasis and baptism in Jesus name and they will tell you that look here whether it be title or whether it be Jesus name irrespective of you are saved the Bible does not teach look here you see God the God that we serve he is a principal God amen don't feel like you can come and serve God anywhere you think God said this is my requirement and if you are serving God, you must stick to what he requires. Anything outside of that, he will not accept. Amen. So as a man, I might accept a certain little thing. I say, look here, it might not reach my full standard, but amen, I will accept it. When it comes to God, it is not like that. Oh God, God is saying, this is what I want. Oh, desire you do what I tell you to do. Are I am not going to accept you. Amen. You're going to find yourself in hell if you don't do what I tell you to do. I would rather, amen, somebody, to do what the Lord says I am to do than to follow the ordinances of men. Because my mother went to a particular church and she baptized in the tie clan. She tell me about the tie clan. Amen. That is what I'm not going to spend any time on. Search the scriptures. We did mention line upon line, precepts upon precepts, line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. We have to get into the scriptures. And that is why I make sure that as I go through baptism, I make sure we, I give it to you from the Old Testament. I give it to you from the New Testament. And I tell you what the Bible says. My opinion is irrelevant right now. But I tell you what the scripture says. And that is why we make sure we spend the time and we find the scriptures. And we read the scriptures that, and we try our best to, to explain so that you might understand. 
Amen. So, so sitting and listening, I don't want you to scoff at what I'm saying. Amen. I don't want you to scoff. I know that I'm talking to somebody tonight. And I don't want you to scoff at what I'm saying when I'm mentioning baptism in Jesus' name. This that I'm telling you about is life. I don't want to wake up in hell. Somebody don't want to wake up in hell and say, look here, if I had only knew, if I have only listened to what the minister said. Amen. But today is the day of salvation. If any man hear his voice, harden not his heart. Amen. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. So as we look now on baptism of the Holy Ghost, when we talk about baptism of the Holy Ghost or the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we are essentially talking about the Spirit of God that has been given to mankind. We must bear in mind, amen, that God alone is holy. Let us look at 1 Peter 1 verse 16. So when we said Holy Ghost are the Holy Spirit, we are talking about the Spirit of God. Amen. So Holy Ghost and, and Holy Spirit are really interchangeable if you look in some script some bibles they will tell you that holy spirit and some bible they will tell you about the holy ghost but the term is really interchangeable but we must bear in mind first peter 1 verses 16 because it is written be ye holy for i am Holy. So we say that it is God alone, amen, that is holy. And the Bible tells us that he is holy. We must also bear in mind St. John 4, verses 24. So God is holy and we establish that from 1 Peter 1, verse 16. Hear what St. John 4, verse 24 says. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. So when we put it together, we get a holy God. Or we get God is holy. Amen. So, so when we talk about holiness and why we emphasize holiness so much is because the God that we serve is holy. And we're going to talk about holiness as we come next week. But look here. The original word that has been transferred from the Greek is pneuma, which means spirit, and hagion, which means holy, ends the term Holy Spirit. Amen. So, the Holy Spirit then is the Spirit of God. If we look at Acts 5, verse 3 and 4, but Peter said, Ananias, why had Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back a part of the price of the land? While it remained, was it not thine own and after it was sold? Was it not thine in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto God, unto men, but unto God. So what? So, so Ananias and his wife, and we know the story. They sold a piece of land, and they came and they give a portion of it. But what they did was to say, "Look here. We sell the land for twenty dollars, and we give you everything, which was not so." Amen. And when they lie, Peter said to them, first of all, he said in verse 3, that you lied to the Holy Ghost. But then when he comes down to verse 4, he said, thou hast not lied unto man, unto men, but unto God. It is simply saying to us that the Holy Ghost, or if we want to say the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit of God is the same. There is no difference. All right. Let us look also at 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Know ye not 
that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy. Which temple are ye? Again, if we look at it, the Bible mentions the Spirit of God and then it mentions the Holy Spirit. So, 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 so there is no difference. The Holy Spirit and the Spirit of God, they are, you know, the same. Romans 8, just one more, we're looking at one more. Romans 8, verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, so we see the, the passage move here from the Spirit of God to the Spirit of Christ. And say, so, no, he is none of his. Amen. So it is the same Spirit, the same Spirit. Amen. That the Spirit of God and the Holy Spirit is the same. Amen. So the Spirit used the term Spirit of God and Spirit of Christ. But though they are different terms, they are referring to the same Spirit, which is the Spirit of God. Amen. So when we say in St. John 4, verses 24, God is a Spirit. I want us to note in St. John 4, verses 24, it did not say God is a Spirit. Amen. It's a God is a spirit, singular. So when the, we read the passages earlier on and they use the term spirit of God and spirit of Christ, they are not talking about two different spirits, but they are talking about one spirit, which is the spirit of God. There is only one spirit of God. And let us go down now to Ephesians 4, verses 6. Verses 4 through to 6. There is one body and one spirit. So let us now stop at that word spirit. Look at it. It is capital S. Now when we talk about, when we see the Bible mentions capital S. It is talking about not the spirit of man. But it is talking about the spirit of God. So there is one body and one spirit, referring to the spirit of God, as you are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So whether... We said the Spirit of God or the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, we are referring to the Spirit of God. I would also like us to know that in order for man to operate the way the Lord wants him to operate, in order for man to live the way how God wants him to live, he cannot do it on his own. It is going to take help from the Lord. And we are going to look at scriptures to tell us this. If a man is going to please God, remember, it is like faith. And remember we mentioned when we talk about faith. The Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. That is what we said. But we also said that this faith to please God, it is God that gave it to men. For God has given to every man a measure of faith, and it is the Bible. But then, when it comes to us living for God, living holy, when it comes to our lifestyle pleasing God, when it comes to us doing the things of God, amen, we cannot do it of ourselves. It is going to take supernatural help. And that help comes from the Spirit of God, which God 
gave to man in this dispensation. But if we look in the dispensation before, dispensations before, you are going to recognize that the Holy Ghost was not given, but God himself moved upon men and caused them to do the work that he wants them to do. So for us to operate the way the Lord wants us to, and for us to walk according to his will, it is going to take the Spirit of God. The Bible in Galatians 5, verses 16 says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and he will not fulfill the loss of the flesh. Amen. So if you're not walking in the Spirit, you're not going to please God because the flesh is going to take over. And we're going to go down to that passage as we go down into the study tonight. So it is going to take the Spirit of God. Let us look at Luke 3 and 6, verse 16. It is going to take the Spirit of God, which he gives us. John answered, saying unto them, I indeed baptize you with water. But one mightier than I cometh, the latch of ish, the latch of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So, like I said, in the different in the dispensation, in this dispensation, God chose to baptize men with the Holy Ghost and with fire. But before now, the Spirit of God moved upon men. And the first scripture we're going to look at to solidify this is Judges chapter 3, verse 10. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel. And went out to war, and the Lord delivered the, that word there, Cush, Hanrish, Hatan, him, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and his hand prevailed against that king. Amen. So, this individual, look here, the Spirit of God came upon him, and he judged Israel. And it was because the Spirit of God why he was able to be victorious in battle against Cush, Hanrish, Hatan, him. Right? It was because the hand of the Lord, the Spirit of God was upon him why he was able, amen, to be victorious in that battle. Let us also look at Isaiah 61 verse 1. So we know Isaiah as a prophet of the Lord and, and he spoke. But hear now what he said. He said, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. So Isaiah said that. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. So even from those times, from the olden time, we recognize that from the fall, it was just hard for man to do the things to please God. Amen. So it took the Spirit of God and God knows this. So from ever since that time, God had it in his intention that look here, there's coming a time when I am not going to rest upon my spirit upon a particular person for him to do a work but I am going to now put my spirit in men. Amen. Judges 6 verse 34 But the spirit of the Lord God came upon Gideon. So Gideon Gideon was threshing wheat and, and boy he, 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 he didn't even know, and the angel said, Thou mighty man of valor. But the Bible said, The Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, and Abiza was gathered unto him. Look here, it was after the Spirit of God came upon Gideon, then Gideon, you know, moved as God would want him to. But let us look at this. 1 Samuel 16, 
13, and 14. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And when he anointed him, what happened? The Bible says, And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. It, so we know David as, as when you talk about kings of Israel. As you say, king of Israel, the first king that anybody know is David. And David was not even the first king of Israel. But he had a heart after the Lord. But the Bible says that after Samuel poured the oil upon him and anointed him in the midst of his virgin, it was that time the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. So from, he was a man of war, a mighty man of war, and it was because the Spirit of God. His heart was at a certain place and it was because the Spirit of God. It was because the Spirit of God came upon him. We could also look at 2 Samuel 23, verse 2, Ezekiel 11, verse 5. Ezekiel 11 says, Then the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me, and he said to me, Say thus, say the Lord. So even the prophets of old, when they spoke, spoke because the Spirit of the Lord came on them. Thus saith the Lord, so you think, house of Israel, for I know thy thoughts. So it was because the Spirit of the Lord rest upon the prophet why he was able to bring forth a word. So whether it is an act or whether it is to say something, it was because of the Spirit of the Lord. The Bible in the New Testament make mention of the scriptures that we hold so dear was written as holy men were moved by the Holy Ghost. Second Peter 1 verse, verses 21 and 22. Knowing this first that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy, the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy man of God spake as they were what? Moved by the Holy Ghost. So here am I telling you that, look here, even the prophets of old, when they utter things, it was because the Spirit of the Lord Move. I want to talk in false prophet, you know. So when we say prophet, we're talking about prophet of God. Amen. Spoke. So in this dispensation, as I was saying, amen, the dispensation of grace, God chose now to put his spirit in man. Romans 5, verses 5. And hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. You hear where God put the Holy Ghost? In our hearts. And the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which God has given unto us. So in this dispensation, God chose to what? Put his spirit in man. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 21 and 22. Now he which established us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God, who hath sealed us and given the earnest of what? The spirit in our hearts. So when we talk about the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit, we say that the terms are interchangeable. And we say that they are referring to the Spirit of God. The ways in which the Bible describes the Holy Spirit, 
persons who receive the Holy Spirit. Um, Acts 2 verse 4 it says that, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Acts 2 verse 33, the promise of the Holy Ghost. Acts 2 verse 38, the gift of the Holy Ghost. Acts 10, 44, the Holy Ghost fell on them. Acts 10 and 45, God poured out the Holy Ghost. Acts 10 and 47, they received the Holy Ghost. Acts 19 and 6, the Holy Ghost came on them. So these are terms now that the Bible uses as it talks about or as it describes how the Holy Ghost um, is given. So it can be poured out, it can be the Holy Ghost came upon them, the Holy Ghost, you know, the Bible used different terms, but it all means that the person is filled with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost fell upon them, is still filled with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost came upon them, is still filled with the Holy Ghost. When we talk about being filled with the Holy Ghost, I want us to understand, and I want us to picture a vessel. It can be filled with the Holy Ghost, but the Bible also used the term baptized with the Holy Ghost. So when we talk about baptized, because John the Baptist said, he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. So when we talk about being filled with the Holy Ghost, or being baptized, remember we said the word baptism come from what? To dip, to plunge, or immerse. So when somebody's filled with the Spirit, God immerse them how he does it, I don't know. But if we talk about the meaning of the word from the original, it is dipping, plunging, or immersing. So God dip us in his spirit. The Bible then says that we are vessels of honor, vessels of the Lord. It means that when we God dip us in his spirit, we are filled with his spirit. So like we have been saying, we don't come here to just tell anybody. Or to just tell you something that come to mind. But we tell you based upon scriptures. Whether we say from the Old Testament, from the New Testament, we come to you from scriptures. We look at both Old and New Testament. Look at what they have to say on the topic. And we mention it line upon line and precept upon precept. So as we continue the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we are going to proceed in this fashion. One, we are going to look at the importance of having the Holy Ghost. Why is it important for an individual to have the Holy Ghost? Two, we are going to look at the prophecies that came about the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. What we looked at earlier on, um, we mentioned that the Spirit of God move upon men, cause them to, to do mighty works and cause them to speak. Amen. But we are going to look in the Old Testament and prophecies that came forth about the Holy Spirit. Then we are going to look at the New Testament, the promise of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. We are going to look at the fulfillment on the day of Pentecost. And then we are going to look at the signs of knowing that I have received the Holy Spirit. And very important. Amen, somebody. So the importance of having the Holy Spirit. Why is it important for an individual to be baptized with the Holy Spirit or to be filled with the Holy Spirit? The Bible in St. John 3, verses 1 to 7. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. We read this when we talk about baptism. But now we're talking about the Holy Ghost. We read it again. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, 
Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of what? Flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not, I say unto thee, he must be born again. So the verse we read does not only place emphasis on water baptism as a part of the conversion process, as a part of the new birth experience, as a part of being born again, but it also places emphasis on spirit baptism. Jesus' exact words, marvel not, I say unto you, you must be born again. And this he said twice, born of the water and born of the spirit. So Jesus said, you must be born again. I want to ask us a question. And we can type in the answers in our chat. If a person is baptized only, is he safe? Type it in your chat. If a person is filled and not baptized, is he safe? According to the scripture that we just read, he is not saved if him the one. So if he's baptized and does not receive the Holy Ghost, he's not saved. If he receives the Holy Ghost and is baptized, he's not saved. Jesus said, you must be born again, born of the water and born of the Spirit. And there is a specific way that he wants you to do it. You must complete both. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. If you are going to complete the conversion process, you must repent of your sins, identify you with the death of Jesus Christ. You must be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, identifying you with the burial of Jesus Christ and you must receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit identifying you with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one that dies for us and we must be identified with him. Being identified with anybody else means it is that person that dies for you. But because Jesus is the one that died for me, I want to be identified with his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. So, why is it important? Why is it important for, for an individual to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Because, one, it is a part of the plan of salvation. Let us read also Romans 8 verses 9. Some folks believe if you're baptized and you don't receive the Holy Ghost, it's heaven. Look here. I can only tell you the scriptures. Romans 8 verses 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now, if 
any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. The English Standard Version says, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. So without the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, he does not own you. Christ is coming back for sons. And his son have his spirit. And he's going to come back for his son with his spirit. Look here. If you don't have the spirit of God, if you're not being baptized with the Holy Spirit, you don't belong to God. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is a part of the plan of salvation. The Bible is clear. How is it that so-called ministers are telling folks, just pray a prayer. Amen. Hallelujah. Just pray a prayer after me and you're safe. The doctrine of prayer unto salvation. And the Bible doesn't teach that. We said it in repentance that the person must be contrite. There must be a genuine sorrow for sins. And mini so-called ministers are telling folks, believe and you're saved. The doctrine unto believe. Once you believe, you're saved. But the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible said that we must be born again. Anyone who is concerned about the soul of an individual and listen to what i'm saying good if a person is concerned about your soul he will not tell you that if you pray one prayer after he tells you how to pray that you are saved if somebody is concerned about where your soul is going to spend eternity he will not tell you that after you come to the altar and say, yes, I believe in the Lord that you are saved and that you're going to heaven. Because the Bible does not teach that. The man who is concerned about your soul is going to tell you that you need to repent, baptize, fill with the Holy Ghost and live holy. There is a vast difference. The reason why some people take on to these things is because it, 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 it appeals to them. It appeals to them. They want the easy way out. But you must be born again. So, the first reason why it is important for us to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it is because it is a part of the plan of salvation. Secondly, the Holy Spirit will raise us up in the rapture and change our body. Romans 8, verse 11. But if the Spirit of Him that raised Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal body by his spirit that dwell in you. So if we don't have this spirit in us, we will never be raised in the rapture. Because a lot of folks think that the church will be here and the church will go through the tribulation. We see what is happening now and we see how oh, folks around us, folks are so nervous and fearful. Folks around us are just dropping out. And this is child's play to what is going to come.
So you can listen to somebody tell you that, look here, once you believe, I am saying that you must be born of the Spirit. If you don't born of the Spirit, you cannot make it into the rapture. Philippians 3 verse 21. For our conversation Yes, from 20 to 21 For our conversation is in heaven From whence also we look for the Savior of the Lord Jesus Christ Who shall what? Change our vile bodies That it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body According to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Our bodies will be fashioned like unto his glorious body when we raise from the dead or when we change. First Corinthians him say, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we will be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last from for the dead shall rise incorruptible, and we shall be changed from this, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So I am saying to us, there is coming a time when if you are dead, Almighty oh God, some folks, they say, look here, when I die, Cremate my body, take the sun and put it all over the sea. Amen. So when Jesus returns, Jesus can't put together and, and, and get to judge. You're making a sad mistake. If he is able to change us from mortal to immortality. Amen. From, from corruptible to incorruption. Then he's able now to gather up the dust that settles on the sea floor. And bring back that man and judge him. But we shall be changed. And the changing agent is the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit there is no changing. If you are flesh you are going to remain flesh. But if you are spirit. The change agent is there and you are going to be changed. Again, why is it is important? Romans 8, 26 through to 27. The spirit that we get makes intercession for us. Likewise, the spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be Uttered. So look here, sometimes we go through some things and, and sometimes we, we just don't know. You go before God and you just don't know what. And the Spirit, Spirit make intercession. Sometimes you're talking to God in an, in an unknown language and the Spirit groaning and the Spirit interceding on your behalf in tongues. Spirit talking unto God. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. And he that search at the heart. Know it what is the mind of the spirit because he make an intercession for the saints according to the will of God. It's important. And, and you know, sometimes sometime we that have the Holy Spirit, you know, we have to call a friend, you know, and say, Fred, beam me up in prayer. And we have the Holy Spirit to make intercession for us. You can imagine somebody that said that they're going to church and don't have the Holy Spirit. He also help us to live a life pleasing to God. A life of sacrifice pleasing to God. So we cannot do it by ourselves as we established earlier on. God knows this and this is why he gave us the gift of the Spirit. By St. John 16 verse 13. As we live and as we try our best to please the Lord, it is 
not within man for, for man to do it. But it takes the spirit of God. And hear what John says now. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Galatians 5, 16 and 17. So the Spirit, when it comes, it will guide us into all truth. It, it, is, it is hard for us as individuals to, 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 to just say, look here, see the truth there? No, it is the Spirit of God that is going to now lead us in that truth. And hence why it is important for us to have the, the Spirit of God. But hear what Galatians said now as it pertains to living pleasing to God and to be a sacrifice. Amen. This I say then. Walk in the Spirit. Oh glory. And he shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit. And the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that he cannot do the things he would do. As Christians, we have two natures, a sinful nature that we were born with. And a nature that we receive when we receive the Spirit of God, when we were born again. Both natures have the desire, one for evil and the other for holiness. One for evil. This is why Paul says, For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I do not, that I do. He said, There is a law that presents himself. That's in my members dwell it. No, but the spirit now desires the things of God. That is why the spirit now will guide us into truth. When we want to do things, the spirit says, Look here. Don't do that thing. Our flesh desires to sin against God. But the Spirit empowers us to walk pleasing to God. When we follow the deepest desire of the Spirit as it, as it shed in our hearts, we will not do the things that displease God, but instead we'll rather walk and do the things that please God. So it is the Spirit, this Holy Spirit, that God gives us, help us to live for Him. Now let us look at the prophecy pertain, prophecies pertaining to the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. So like we mentioned earlier on, that God, it was in His intention to film men with his spirit to baptize men with his spirit in a time to come but God gradually re reveal himself to mankind through the different dispensation amen and so what God does in the earlier years in the old testament when we read is that God overshadowed men and we went through the scripture where God overshadowed men and and caused them to speak and he empowered them amen to do the things that he wants them to do. We mentioned about King David that it was the Spirit of God after he was anointed. That was the time the Spirit of God came upon him and he became the king that we now know. But it happened because of the Spirit of God. But before this, it was overshadowing. But in the Old Testament, the same Holy Spirit of God Move up and holy men and they speak. First Peter 1 verses 10 through to 12. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. Who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Searching what or what man of time the spirit of Christ which was in them did signify. When it, was, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ 
and the glory that should follow. And to whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. In these verses, Peter helped his fellow believers to keep their suffering in perspective by making two comparisons. One, the first comparison of the Old Testament prophets to the New Testament saints. Secondly, Peter compares the New Testament saints to angel. What he concludes was that the prophet search what time the Spirit of Christ would come to dwell in men. And that the angel desired to look into it. So the prophets of old, when they spoke about the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, they wanted a time, they wanted to know when this would happen. But it was not in their time. And the angels wanted to look into it. So what we have with being baptized is the, with the Holy Spirit is something special. Amen. So the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through to 33. Be all the days come saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with your fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws in their inward parts and write in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. The covenant is in our hearts. The old covenant, look here, stone it was written on. Moses break it. It was written again. But God wanted something personal. He wanted to write now the laws in our heart. That is why we mentioned a couple of weeks ago, you know. So that look here. Even if the thing is not written in the Bible verbatim. And it's not there word for word. There is a law now written in our hearts, you know. By the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. And if it's not written in the Bible, the Holy Ghost will convict us. So you might not see it word for word because we said at that time that a lot of people want to see it word for word. But God is saying, look here, it is written in our hearts through the Holy Ghost. So the covenant is in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So let us also look now at Joel 2. Verse 28 and 29. Verses 28, 29. Of prophecies to note about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It is found in the book of Joel. Some 800 years before Christ came to earth, the prophet Joel wrote of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And upon also the servants and upon the unmade. In those days will I pour out my spirit. So Joel may, may not have fully understood the prophecy that he gave, but God moved upon him. And those words came 
to him by inspiration of the Holy Ghost to let us know that the day will come when he will pour out his spirit. Amen. So day was coming at time. Joel saw it. Joel prophesied about it. And he said that in the time to come, God is going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Jeremiah saw it, and Jeremiah prophesied about it. Ezekiel saw it. But as we go down, we we'll talk about it. So now let us look at the New Testament promise of the Holy Ghost. John the Baptist, Matthew 3, verse 11. John the Baptist preached the promise of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. John said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but she that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So look here now. From the whole testament, line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. So hear what happened. The prophets, they talk about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So here again was the forerunner. We said it about repentance. We said it about water baptism. And it is the same thing with the Holy Ghost. John the Baptist came. And he said, look here, one is coming. And he is going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And with fire. John did not preach. And this is a point to note. John did not preach that look here. It's only a certain set of persons. That God is going to pour his spirit on. But John said, look here. He's going to pour his spirit. He's going to put his spirit. Amen. Baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. There was no particular group. There was no just for a period. But through the whole church era, he pours out his spirit. Jesus promise the spirit baptism Luke 11 13 he said if he then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children how much more shall your heavenly father give the holy spirit to them that ask him so some folks look here you have to ask, you know. So if you ask him for the Holy Spirit, he's going to give you the Holy Spirit. And I just feel like injecting this now. Look here. There is only two things that can prevent you. Segue in a little bit, but I follow in the Holy Spirit. Two things that can prevent you from receiving the Holy Ghost. One, if you don't repent. Because Jesus said he will not pour new wine into dirty vessels so if you repent then so if you don't repent you're not going to receive the holy ghost but if you don't believe that you going god is going to give you the holy ghost or that god can give you the holy ghost you're not going to receive the holy ghost so two things can prevent you is either you don't believe or you're not repented but if he then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? St. John 7, 37 through to 39. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood on Christ saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet given glorified so the passage tell us this one 
that the Holy Spirit was promised to all who believe. So, believe and you will receive. Two, the gift of the Holy Ghost which Jesus referred to did not come until after his glorification. So, like we've been saying, is a whole lot of things that we could talk about. The baptism of the Holy Ghost are probably about two or three Bible studies. But we're just talking about some of the main, we're just condensing the thing and just talking about some of the important things. St. John 14, 16 through to 18. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but he know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. So Jesus talk about the Holy Ghost coming, St. John 14, verses 26, about the comforter which the Father will send in my name. That scripture we read already. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So Jesus spoke about the comforter coming, the promise of the comforter. Let us look now at the fulfillment. Amen. And we look at the fulfillment in Acts 2. Verses 1 to 4. The fulfillment of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit happened on the day of Pentecost. Acts 2 verses 1 to 4. And the day of Pentecost was fully come. They were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So, all of the prophecies that we look at in the Old Testament, that talk about the Holy Ghost coming Forth, and there was a time when God would pour out His Spirit. Amen. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will come. He promised to eat the Holy Spirit even in the New Testament. All of this was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost, that long-awaited day, that day that, that, that the prophets wanted to know when that time would come. Amen. The angels desired to look into it. Amen. Happened on the day of Pentecost when they were gathered together in one accord, in one place, and God poured out His Spirit upon them. It was a new era. Folks have never seen this. It was the birth of the church. It was a new birth, a new thing God was doing. This thing that was prophesied was a new thing. So the church continued to proclaim the baptism of the Holy Spirit to all. Peter got up on the day of Pentecost along with the support of the other apostles and preached Acts 2, 38 and 39. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and he shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and unto your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So the church continued to preach the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and others were saved. Others received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. These people that Peter preached to, Amen. Acts 2, verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day they were added to the church, about 3,000 souls. If these 3,000 souls were added to the church, it meant 
that they were filled, water baptized, repented. Amen. That is why they were added to the church. It meant that they had to experience the same experience that the apostles experienced. They had to now fulfill what the apostles preach. Repentance, water baptism in Jesus' name and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. So the church preached and they believed. Acts 8, 4 to 17 tells us, right, that the apostles were at Jerusalem, heard that the Samaria had received the word of God. They sent them Peter and John unto them, whom when they were came down, prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was not fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then lay they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. The church continued to preach the Holy Ghost. Acts 10, 44 to 46, Peter preached to Cornelius' his house, and Cornelius received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Acts 10, 46, 44 to 46, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So the church continued to preach about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And persons continue to receive the Holy Spirit. Now in this day and age as a church, we continue to preach about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We continue to preach and tell folks and teach and tell folks that baptism of the Holy Spirit is a part of the plan of salvation. It is a significant part. Look here, all of it, the plan of salvation is significant because none, you can't be righteous, you can't get to know God, you can't get to Him without fulfilling all of the aspects of the plan of salvation. So, every step in the salvation process is important. Amen. And the church continue today to preach that. If you find a place that they say that they are church and they're not preaching this to you, look here, find somewhere else and go. It sounds harsh. Amen. You find somewhere else and go. Because this is if you love yourself and you love your soul and you want to be spend an eternity with Jesus Christ, find somewhere that teach. I'm not telling you to come to where I am. But I'm saying find somewhere that teaches repentance, water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, in filling up the Holy Spirit and living holy. Amen. Outside of that, there is no, hallelujah, there is no salvation. Outside of that is eternal damnation. Amen, somebody. So it's important then that we recognize that in order to fulfill the plan of salvation, we must receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit along with all the other aspects. So, the evidence of receiving the Holy Spirit. Now, a lot of folks tell folks that, look here, once you believe, you receive the Holy Ghost. Just leave the altar and you receive the Holy Ghost. Now, when I receive the Holy Ghost, I knew because I spoke in tongues. My wife spoke in tongues. And even now, with the anointing come, we still speak in tongues. And now when the Spirit make it intercession, as we said, we speak in tongues. I have three sons. Oh, glory to God. Amen. 
and the three of them, oh glory to God, received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They all spoke in tongues. I have a number of church brothers and church sisters. And we all spoke in tongues. I come against the doctrine that is telling people, amen, that the speaking in tongues is only for the apostles and only for a period of time. I am telling somebody tonight that even in this era, the church era, speaking in tongues is the evidence that you receive the Holy Spirit. It is the initial evidence to say that, yes, you will receive the Holy Ghost. Oh, glory to God. The, the, the doctrine, look here, if you're not careful enough, if you're not careful, you'll find yourself in hell. Amen. Because people, they are trying, how, when somebody come up with a genuine question, how over that church, amen, the people talk in tongues, how over that church, amen. My next door neighbors, I hear him, I hear him wife, I hear him children, them. Speaking in tongues when they're in worship. How is it that I don't speak in tongues? Uh, and somebody could tell you that, look here, uh, look here, speaking in tongues is for the apostles. Well, I am an apostle. My wife and my children, look here, I want us to understand, amen, that the devil is to steal, kill, and in the, destroy, and he's trying to destroy in some life. If you don't look at things for yourself, if you don't diligently seek God, you're going to find yourself lost because people will tell you that, look here, you don't have to talk in tongues. The apostle Paul said, you must keep yourself quiet. And they talk all kind of things. But let us look at the scripture. Speaking in tongues is a supernatural gift. Amen. A supernatural gift that is not learned, but is given to man when he received the Spirit. So through the Holy Ghost now, because the Bible says, you know, it is not of ourselves, but the Bible says men speak as they are moved upon by the Holy Ghost, that is the prophet. But then now, it says in the New Testament here, that look here, they spoke with tongues as the what? Spirit gave utterance. In other words, they speak because the Spirit speak. If the Spirit don't say nothing, the mouth shut. And this is how powerful God is. Amen. So the Greek word that when we talk about tongues, it, come, it means glossa, which means tongues, earthly or heavenly. Amen. And tongues could just be one less by itself. Look here, speaking in tongues. Is something that is done by, a, by the spirit that is in man. And man must utter what the spirit is saying. It might be earthly. So we can talk in tongues and somebody else understand what is being said. But it can be heavenly. When we talk in tongues, the Bible says that we talk to God and we magnify him. Oh, glory to God. So Isaiah, now let us look at Isaiah 28. Oh, glory to God. 11 and 12. I want us to understand somebody, amen, that the prophet talk about it. He said, far with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to these people. To whom he said, this is the rest wherewith he may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Oh God, I feel like I talk a little bit about rest and the Sabbath as we look on this passage. Amen. Because some folks is telling you, oh God, that God rests on the Sabbath. Amen. And God is a spirit. A spirit don't need to rest. And God, why are you taking me here? A spirit don't need to rest on the Sabbath. But this is the rest that the prophet was talking about. And if we're dealing with Sabbath, we could talk about the rest from the Old Testament into the New Testament. Amen. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Oh God, if I should talk about this doctrine, you see, man, I don't stop. 
and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Amen. This rest that Jesus was talking about was not a physical rest. Amen. But it was a spiritual rest, a rest from sin. But let me get back to it. Amen. For with stammering lips and another tongue, oh glory to God, will I speak, will I speak, will I speak. The time is now that in the church era, the time is now when God speaks to the church through tongues, talk to the individual manifest, amen, speaking in tongues by the Holy Spirit that dwell. This is the era that the prophet was talking about. So speaking in tongues is a part of the church today. Oh, glory to God. I tell you that my entire family, amen, speak in tongues. It is, it is not only for the apostle, but it is for, amen, bless the name of Jesus Christ. It is for the church. Amen. So if you're serving God and you, and you say, look here, yes, me believe. Yes, me have the Holy Ghost. Just like the apostle asks John the Baptist disciples, and to what then were you baptized? Because if you hear and have the Holy Ghost, you must talk in tongues. Yes, Jesus. If you hear and have the Holy Ghost, you must talk in tongues. So look at this scripture. Mark 16, verse 17. Look here, they're telling you a lie. If they tell you that it is only for the apostles. They're telling you a lie if they tell you, amen, it's doctrine from the bottom pit of hell. Amen. It's doctrine that is to damn your soul. If they tell you that, look here, uh, just believe and you receive the Holy Ghost. And you never yet speak in tongues. You don't have the Holy Ghost. I mean, just, just so me have to put it. Because look here, Jesus said, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they shall cast out devils. They shall what? Speak with new tongues. This word comes from the same word, glossa, which means tongues early and tongues. Look here. If they tell you that, look here. It is for the apostles alone. They're telling you a lie. I can't tell you because I talk in scripture. And if they tell you that, you have the Holy Ghost. And you never yet talk in tongues. They're telling you a lie. The 120 on the day of Pentecost. People heard them spoke in tongues. That day when the Holy Ghost poured out. So no matter if it was early language they were talking about talking. Um, and the Grecians and those that were there understood. It happened. The Bible says as the Spirit gave them utterance. The Grecians were there and they understood. But the apostles. The, those who were talking in tongues probably don't even know the, Greek, the, the, the Grecian language. Because it can be earthly and it can be heavenly. Amen. So on the day of Pentecost, the, the, the Jews, amen, they received the Holy Ghost and they spoke in tongues. But let us also know, go down, and I'm going to close with this one. Amen. After this one, we'll look at Galatians 5. Acts 10, 44 to 46. Now this is an interesting one. While Peter yet spoke the words to, spoke the words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished. Now the circumcision were the Jews. Amen. And the Jews were astonished. As many that came with Peter. Now if I'm going to paint a picture. You have to understand what is happening here. The, the Cornelius was a devoted man. But Cornelius was not saved. Peter got the key on the day of Pentecost. And he turned that. Uh, um, uh, uh, and God, sorry, Jesus gave him the key, Acts chapter, um, Matthew 16, and Peter turned that key on the day of Pentecost. But here it was for the first Gentile to hear the gospel. Peter have to again turn the key. Amen. 
So Peter now went down to Cornelius' house to tell him what to do to be saved. But remember, you know, the Bible said that he was a devoted man. And while Peter, yet, so the man was, the man's heart was ready, he was at the place. And while Peter yet spake, the Holy Ghost fell upon them. And they which came with Peter heard and were astonished as many that came with him. Because that on the Gentiles altar was poured out, was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. They of the circumcision heard and were astonished. What they heard was that the Gentiles also received the Holy Spirit. The Gentiles received the Holy Spirit. How oh, they know that they received the Spirit? Because they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Oh, glory to God. I am telling us tonight that if you are in something and they tell you that you have the Holy Ghost and you never yet talk in tongues, you need to check it again. I'm sorry, I might sound harsh. I might sound blunt, but we just talk in the Bible. So it is the initial sign to show that you receive the Holy Ghost. And then there's ongoing evidence that you have the Holy Ghost. Galatians 5 verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Amen. So the spirit that the, the Bible is talking about is the Holy Spirit. When he abides in us, we will bear the fruit. Jesus said, by the fruit you shall know them. So if somebody have the Holy Spirit, you will know based on the behavior, the beer of fruit that is love is one fruit, you know. The fruit, never say fruits, of the Spirit is love. But there are different aspects to this fruit you now, which is joy, peace, long suffering, goodness, temperance, meekness against such there is what? No love. So the evidence is there. And if you see some person behave in a certain way, it might be that the person is young in Christ and it's going to take a time for them to change. But if somebody is in Christ for a long, long time, man, you must see the fruit that is being born. But look here. This baptism of the Holy Ghost is a part of salvation. We cannot please God without the Spirit. Because the Spirit lost it against the flesh and the flesh against the Spirit. And we were born with this Adamic nature. I want to tell somebody tonight that we need to search the scriptures. Them, there is truth. And in them, salvation is written out. The idea of this talking about doctrine is not to mention the different doctrines that the idea about it is about to save souls. The idea about it is to get other sheep that is not of this fold to come to this fold. Because the time is nigh, even at the door. God bless you tonight. Thank you for tuning in. Next week, as we come, we will talk about holiness and we will just go as the Spirit of God lead us and, and, and continue talking about doctrine. As we go through, though, I want you to understand, though, that we are going to get to the doctrines that the Bible talks about. As we go through, you, have, you would have heard me talking about the different doctrines that are there now. That is not written in the Bible. But they are there and they are trying 
to distract us. They are trying to turn us from the truth. But look here. Content for the faith. God bless you tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. Just bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we appreciate you tonight. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercies. We thank you, O oh God, for all that you have done, for all that you are doing, even as we present the word. We thank you for the light that, O oh God, you have touched. We thank you for the life, God, that you will touch. We pray, God, that you will let this word go forth, mighty God, and, and that even in time to come it will accomplish and that souls will be saved because that is the aim. Souls will be kept, mighty God, hallelujah, to give you glory. Oh God, as we pray tonight, we pray, mighty God, for our family members, Jesus Christ, those who are called by your name, those who, God, are under the weather with this covid virus. We pray, God, that you will touch our deacon right now, mighty God, our minister who is in the, the hospital. Touch him, God, brother Raman. We call him by name. Amen. And we pray, mighty God, that you will touch him from the crown of his head right now to the sole of his feet, mighty God. Oh, God, we pray that you will cause him to recover, God, from this, that you will increase that oxygen level, God, to to normalcy. Amen. And that you will cause him, Jesus, to have a testimony. We pray that right now you will just visit him in the name of Jesus. That you will show yourself strong on his behalf. We pray, God, that you will touch his wife. Give her the strength. Touch the children. God, every member, every other person who is affected by this virus. In the name of Jesus, we ask, mighty God, that you will touch, that you will heal and that you will deliver. We pray, God, that your will be done. And we ask, God, that as we go through the rest of this week, that you be with us, that you help us to practice the social distance, that you help us to be safe, wear our masks, Lord Jesus, and that you will guide us along the way. Let your will be done tonight as we give you thanks in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And let somebody say in Jesus' name, Amen. Just clap your hands unto the Lord. Amen, amen, amen. And just lift them and give him glory. Say, thank you, Jesus. We bless, hey, we bless your name, God, and we give you glory. Amen, amen. We worship and we adore you tonight. You are king of kings. You are lord of lords. Yes, God, you are the conquering lion of the tribe. Oh, God of Judah, we bless you. We bless you. We love you, Jesus. Amen. By way of announcement, remember now there is a three days a night, three days, three nights of fasting beginning September 11 and it goes through to September 13, right? It's a period of consecration, a period of fasting, a period of presenting ourselves to the Lord. Let us look at the time, you know, the days are evil, amen? And we want to just present ourselves to God, present the issues before God. And, you know, to ask his help, you know, to keep us during this time. You know, special prayer time. There are special prayer times for each day, you know, where we pray for one hour individually or with our families. Amen. Friends or other colleagues, you know, prayer group. 6 a.m., 3 p.m., and 6 p.m. So these are the times that we want to set to, for us to pray together as family, as, as a friend, as a, as a prayer partner group. Pray together. And remember, at 6 p.m. on these nights, you know, there will be prayer meeting. Amen. And we want all folks to join in. Amen. We want nobody to be left behind. You know, it, it, it is just a time of consecration. And, you know, if I must confess, you know, the Lord was just tugging on my heart and said, look here, it's time for the three day now, you know, because, you know, you set the thing, you know, throughout the year. And the Lord was saying, it's time and, you know, Kind of pushing it, pushing it, and, you know, Bishop does a three days. So, yeah, man, I welcome it. And we're asking everybody, you're able to go out, you know, if you have some form of medical condition, you know what to do. So just do it and just be faithful in the name of Jesus Christ. God bless you. You know, the prayer meeting will be via Zoom. And, you know, on the, the WhatsApp, you will see the login. So you can just join in and, you know, let us as one family pray together. And, you know, strengthen each other. God bless you tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.